Nick Matthews, Mark Leonard Winter. Congratulations on One Eyed Girl. Thank, Thank you. you. Great Can pleasure you being guys, here. Can you guys, both of you, alternately, please just describe the film for us? I'll let Mark do that. Well, uh, it's about a psychiatrist who loses a patient um, and consequently has a bit of a meltdown, really, a psychological meltdown, and ends up sort of at first trying to self-medicate in the best way he can and then ends up joining a, uh, a sort of alternate living community, a, a, a cult of, of sorts. You can say cult. Yeah. I can say cult now um, to, you know, try and uh, uh, get some sense of purpose to his life and then everything is not as it seems on this idyllic farming community. So there's, there's a lot going on. Now, Nick, um, you wrote the thing, but you let your actor describe it. Why? Did you, are you testing him? Or? Well, I co-wrote it. Yeah, I just wanted to see if he could, he could remember the story. Um, no, I just, I'm always interested myself to hear, you know, other people dis you know, people's descriptions of, of the film. And I, I probably would have said something, you know, kind of more like a, uh, you know, a poster kind of quote, like mm. dark and intense thrill ride. I, I, my instinct at the moment is not to uh, to tell the story of the film, so that was great. I'm glad he said it. Well, it certainly escalates very, very nicely. Where did the idea for this story about a shrink who loses his nut joining a cult come from? Well, I think... Did you like my description? <laughs> that was yes, great. I, I like that. I like that okay. a lot. It, look, it... it um, I think, you know, we started when myself and Craig Behenna, who's the co-writer of the film, and David Goh, who's the producer, when we all sat down and and um, started to um, talk about making a thriller, um, you know, the, there was a little a little kind of tiny seed of, of an idea that, that, that I'd had that I'd scribbled out on a, a piece of paper that I must find one day that... Um, that um, was a, just a scene. It was a, a woman um, running across a field, uh, whispering a kind of mantra to herself, which was, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed girl is queen. And that had been informed, I think, by... Uh, well, very, very late one night, I was watching a documentary from the UK about uh, a woman who... Um, a young woman who was um, on a, uh, let's say, a cult, belonged to a cult uh, in Utah, and um, she had determined that it was, it was, she wanted to get away and go and try and live the status quo life, you know. And, and um, she did that, and, and, and then after a time, she kind of realised that that wasn't that that life was wasn't for her that normal life. And she began to question, um, you know, the kind of the notion of freedom and, and you know what it meant to be a free person and not live with control or ideology or religion or spirituality or any of the things one associates with you know, groups, um, you know, who are out there on farms, you know, doing their thing. She was free to do whatever she wanted to do. And uh, th that to me was, as a notion, was really, um, was a great catalyst in my mind. You know, the idea that, well, you're free in, in our kind of world, in, in the Western world, particularly, let's say, we, we are, um, we're not controlled by any, you know, by any wisdom or any religious powers. Mm. Um, but what it is that we mostly end up doing um, is destroying ourselves. Um, we're free to, to, you know, to, to live sort of quiet lives of desperation, to sell, you know, to medicate, over medicate ourselves, over stimulate ourselves, do all the things that we are now accepting as, as normal life. And there's many people that, that won't accept that and don't. And obviously there are great battles raging as we speak in the world between all these forces. And I think that in itself is inspiration. So in a, in an odd way, you know, we could have made a war movie out of this, you know, that seed. We could have, the three of us could have sat down and, and kind of said, you know, let's make a movie about, um, you know, a guy who goes and has to shoot people in Afghanistan. As it turns out, there's an element of that. There's a crossover into themes of war. But what we chose to do was make a film about this guy here, um, who's, you know, a psychiatrist who's self-medicating and destroying himself slowly, um, who's racked with guilt and pain and, and looks for an alternative way to live. Marcus and Actor, I'm very keen to know how you responded when you read the script about the rhythmic nature of the dialogue. Well, I guess I was looking at it um, in terms of the difference in language between the sort of therapeutic and sort of Western pharmaceutical uh, versions of what therapy 
is, which is you know being uh, pl- playing a, a a psychiatrist in the in the film. You know his language is very different to the language of the farm, and I guess as an actor, I was just sort of you know it. it I'm so cynical towards those terms of phrase, you know, um, you know, the gift and pain and release and, you know, we, we, you know, I sort of did feel like both as a person and as a character, I, I, I sort of had to go like, oh, this is all a bit hippy dippy, isn't it? You know, and, uh, you know, it's all a bit wishy washy. I mean, let's get to the, you know, psycho, you know, psych, psychological root of the problem, and then we'll address it with some medication. Um, so I guess I was sort of interested in that, and then, you know, there's. I think there's a lovely moment um, in the movie where, you know, he succumbs to those ideas and really embraces them, and and realizes that he does feel some release and some completeness. You have got a third act. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Noticing that more and more Australians... Is there some text? Oh, here's the text. Are, yeah. oh, the, it's just the, that's a side comment yeah. um, about a long-standing complaint that I've had that too many Australian films are two-act films yes. and they don't deliver a satisfying third act. Yeah. More and more Australian films now recognise the importance mm. of making sure that an audience leaves the th- theatre with some sense of... Of satisfaction. It's relevant. I mean, it's relevant to you know, um, as both a writer and a and a filmmaker. I mean, it's relevant to both of us, you know, and all of us involved in the film. You know, particularly, you know, David, who's the editor as well. I mean, you know, and it's by yeah, no accident that the film has a classical structure. I mean, you know, I, I agree with you. I think you know. Occasionally, you get a film that doesn't have one, and you know, and it, it works. They're often sort of they feel more like art projects, you know, but and they're good ones, and they're often beautifully made. And there's plenty of examples. But I think with this film, and particularly as a first film for all of us in our respective roles, I I, I wanted to take an audience on a on a ride, you know, and and you know, it's uh, without getting into you know spoilers. I you know there are things about the story that that are anathema to. I think a typical, you know, third act uh, in terms of the film's protagonism. Um, but I think, you know, what what I'm really pleased with is is despite the fact that there are some s- big shocks and surprises in this story, and you know, and that there are things about that that set us aside from, let's say, a, a Hollywood studio film in terms of what we deliver. Um, I I'm really pleased that the response so far has just been one of um, absolute appreciation of it feeling like a rounded story yeah. and that people um, are happy. Um, I don't know if happy is quite the word. They're satisfied mm. by by the ending. you know. And, and the film contains not only a third act but a kind of a very brief denouement as well, which is important you know, in a classical story that you not only can you, you... You don't want to end your story at a kind of cataclysm. You want to also kind of breathe out what you've just seen and, and know that maybe life, you know, get some concept of an understanding of what happens when once the credits have finished. Right. Now, having said that, um, one thing that is noticeable is that it's all in the one location. A, I guess a more conventional film would have put some sort of tension element in there by having someone from the outside, perhaps a doctor's friend or a colleague, wondering... Where did he go? What happened to him? And then cutting from the cult location to this person searching. So there's that tension element in there. I'm presuming, Nick, that you guys considered having that in the screenplay and decided to leave it out. You're nodding? I'm, How come? I'm in complete agreement. Absolutely, in traditional terms, you know, there is, um, you know, you, you, you kind of, Often you want those characters who, um, you know, who who offer up the rational point of view, you know, when the protagonist is doing something bizarre and who has disappeared into, you know, what in, in sort of academic screenwriting terms they call the special place, like in The Wizard of Oz, you know, when she's zoomed off into, you know, um, the, the land of Oz. 
Um, yes, indeed. And, and in that way, you would be splitting the subjectivity between the protagonist and someone else, or the protagonism of the film would be shared. I think what we found as we wrote this story was that we never wanted um, to deviate from that subjectivity, and it never worked, because then it started to feel like a procedural cop story. And, I, and you know, with what we're doing and the kind of film that it was, um, it's, it's a film that you need to feel. It's visceral, you know, it has a very strong subjectivity. The camera is almost always on this guy, um, and certainly the story is propelled by his decisions or, um, or what happens to him at least, and, and it just never worked. What are some of the practicalities of making a low-budget film now that are better than, say, five years ago? Yeah, look, what I would say to that, to that notion is that, you know, there's never, there's never enough money. I, I worked on things, when I was an assistant, I worked on it, something that was $150 million. It was called Band of Brothers, and it was a HBO Terrific war series. Show. And, um, you know, on those sets, people were haggling about, you know, how much gaffer tape um, they could have, you know. And, and that's just the nature of film, is that people want stuff, and then someone else has to kind of indulge that want and and to, to varying degrees, they indulge that. I think the strength that we had with this production was that um, we had a group of, you know, a core group of people who were kind of multi-skilled. For a start, they were they were skilled in, in the mechanics, as you say, that, you know, and, you know, I used to be a DOP before I was a director. The producer is an editor and, in fact, you know, and edited the film. You know, Craig, who plays Tom in the film, is one of the co-producers of the film. So I think, you know, to use a, a cliche, it, you know, it's sweat equity. That's what the film is financed part partly on and and um, you know we stuck with the film and and polished and nursed and and again cliches abound but you know you never finish a film you only abandon it and that's what we you know eventually we you know thankfully we had a brilliant premiere over there in Austin um, to, to you know which was a target that we had to hit but we all just worked on it you know for a long long time David and I sat you know doing the the coloring you know of the film and grading it and all that sort of stuff but I mean obviously digital technology these days is such that um, you know it, it is getting cheaper and that technology is you know, for 5000 bucks, you can buy a camera that ostensibly looks like something that, you know, Avengers is shot on. It has the same amount of pixels. So that's a great advantage. Mark, why do a film like this? You've got, for a young actor, you have quite an extensive filmography. Yes. Don't you have better things to do, more money-making ventures to do, rather than appearing in a low-budget, independent uh, film such as this? Well, seemingly not. <laughs> but uh, for me... You know, I'd never played a true lead, and the proposition of this script was terrifying. And I guess I really wanted to know if I could carry that weight, if I could, you know, hel helm a film. So it 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 was a sort of no-brainer, really, for me. I, I just I, I wanted to know uh, if I could. Um, create the complexity of, of that character, if I could find um, the depths of, of where that person was. And I don't think perhaps reading the script, I quite realized, you know, what those depths were. Um, but I, yeah, I, you know, as it, you, you always just want to get your hands on the best material and something that's going to take you as a actor, artist, uh, to places that are a little bit frightening or um, where you're not, not sure of what the outcome will be. And this was a, a perfect example of that. And also thematically, you know, the, it felt quite rare what the film is tackling thematically, something that I'd never really come across. It wasn't sort of uh, me breaking out of jail with a sawn off, trying to run away from my ice addiction or something like that. You know, it was sort of, uh, it was sort of a, a, a different proposition about how do we live how do we deal with ourselves how do we move forward um, in some senses I found it kind of unlike any Australian film I'd read it it's sort of talking about feelings there's no silent father-son relationship in the piece you know what I mean there's yeah. you know it was quite rare to yeah. me